Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. We have Lucas Raymond to thank for this episode. Like 13 seconds away from this being a completely different podcast. I've I've never been so relieved about a Red Wings win because the effort was there after the first period, but it all just seemed to be like one period and one soft goal was just too much to overcome. And I was thinking, like, what are we going to do? Like, this is... Like this, how, how does this keep happening? And it was tough because for most of the game, Detroit actually had it figured out. And Lucas Raymond, I, I give that guy the key to the city, make him the owner of the team. He is dragging the Red Wings forward, kicking and screaming. Kane helped, of course, but like none of this without Lucas Raymond. Build him a statue now. I don't care. That game was the biggest roller coaster of emotions of any game this season in a season that has been a never ending roller coaster. People might think that noise in the background is the uh, 1990 Honda Civic hatchbacks driving past Ryan's house, but it's actually <laughs> the Brinks trucks that are backing up to Lucas Raymond's house at this moment. It started, yeah, last night and has not stopped. Oh, man. The amount of money that he has added to his contract just in this losing streak. I've never seen a losing streak elevate a player's status so much, but he is he's changed the narrative and he's... We'll get into it after, but I think he actually, like as much as he's going to get paid more now, he might help Detroit on the Mo Sider front, but that's for later. I could do without the heart attacks. Like that was. The first period was uh, not not a great outcome after 20 minutes. In a eight game stretch where the Red Wings had been playing their worst hockey at of maybe any point in the rebuild, that might have been the single worst period. And I know they've had a few bad ones, but there was, what, three or four breakaways for Columbus. Shots were 20 to five, two goals against, and at no point did it look like the Red Wings even cared to be there, despite Columbus's best efforts to hand it to Detroit with the number of power plays they gave them. It was even to the point where, you know, after the game and the excitement, Derek alone was, like, no one is overreacting here. Like, that was a shocking period of hockey. It just didn't make sense. Anyhow. It all turned out well. I think everyone was holding their breath for the the last minute or so there. You're happy for the win. Overjoyed at the win. Like, very much it's Jover, we're so back. But some routine wins would be good again. But we'll take what we can get. Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, and lots more. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. Brad, I, I should recognize you first. You are in rough shape, my man. <laughs> I'm battling right now more than you could possibly realize. Evan and I are sitting here as I'm like typing up the show notes, chatting about golf, talking about driving and the weather, and your head is just in your hands. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, we should get started soon. <laughs> Brad, Brad says to me very gently, he goes, well, I did park my car 40 minutes ago. <laughs> so I, was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, point taken. Very fair. <laughs> Folks, there's, on, a, there's a non-zero chance I don't finish this episode right now. We'll, uh, we'll be sure to weekend at Bernie's here for the rest of it. <laughs> Honestly, on, I'd appreciate it. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. It'll be your most positive episode ever. People are like, wow, we love Brad's attitude all of a sudden. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be talking about the Detroit Red Wings game that happened in a big way against the Columbus Blue Jackets, the horrendous start in the way they turned it around, Lucas Raymond's heroics, Patrick Kane, Showtime once again, Simon Edvinson factoring in, and all the other storylines from that game. We'll be having an extended conversation of how Edvinson looked, uh, Lucas Raymond's streak of play as of late, the playoff race, what's upcoming for Detroit, and updates on Dylan Larkin's injury as well as uh, what's going to happen in net for the Red Wings moving forward. After that, we are going to be talking a little bit more about uh, some Red Wings news from that game, from you know post-trade deadline to what's going to happen in the offseason, and that's going to be joined by Max Boltman of the Athletic Detroit I say it in the interview, but Max committed to that when Detroit was down 2 nothing after the first. So that is a hero right there, like right behind Lucas Raymond in my mind. Uh, updates on Detroit Red Wings prospects as they signed Carter Guylander to a two-year ELC. And then I want to have a, a conversation about the Raymond Insider contracts from 
basically from the fallout of everything that's happened. And then we'll jump into some NHL news before we get into overtime. Before all that, I want to let you know that this podcast is primarily supported by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to join the dub dub club, as Steve Dangle named it a long time ago, and get some really great benefits like access to our bonus overtime Patreon exclusive episodes, which record and post right after these main ones. You also get access to our Patreon exclusive Discord community. As well, we're giving away two tickets to every Red Wings home game this season, the vast majority going to our Patreon supporters. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but the Red Wings needed to walk away from this game in Detroit against one of the worst teams in the NHL with something. I have said that more than once of late in some variety, but against the Columbus Blue Jackets, who are just a listless, lost team who can't score and get scored on a lot, they needed to walk away with something. And that first 20 minutes was it's impressive that I can even say this considering the losing streak, you know, eight of nine, but that 20 minutes was shocking. That's the best word to describe it. I know last episode we were piping off about how a team could have this little motivation and effort in the middle of a playoff battle. The first real playoff battle they've been in, in, eight years, seven, seven, eight years, whatever it's been basically the entire length of this podcast, but we won't go on about that. (laughs) And yeah, it seemed like this was the get right weekend because they played Buffalo and played well against Buffalo on Saturday, beat them. They were walking into Pittsburgh the next day, a team that looked probably about as listless as the Red Wings had leading up to that point. And then they get throttled. And it's like, all right, well, back to back with travel. Sure. Shouldn't happen at the NHL level, but sure, whatever. You're looking at Columbus, an already bad team who's missing about half their lineup, several key players, and you have them at home with rest. This is one of those games where you're like, yeah, it's going to be 5 nothing by the end of the first period. The Red Wings are just going to outclass them, out-hustle them. They've got something to play for. And after that first period, yeah, the only word to really describe it was shocking. Although I think I used embarrassing on Twitter a few times. It was embarrassing. But shocking is the more apt word. I was saying, like, th- this team has a a flu or a bug going around. And you can see it on guys. Like, guys were missing practice and were game time decisions. There are so many injuries. Like, Edmonton was in because Wallman was out. I think Perron and Comfer both have nagging injuries. Obviously, Larkin's been out forever. This team is is battling through something right now. So a certain amount of guys looking off is going to be expected, but not to that degree, not to the point where they were getting walked all over by Columbus. You know, going back to what I said before in previous episodes of, you know, these guys are just gripping their sticks too tight. You were seeing more of the same. And the first Columbus goal came because Christian Fisher bobbled the puck. Zach Wierenski Actually, who was it who scored the first goal, Evan? I have no idea. <laughs> so if you, in case you're new to the show, Evan is horrified of Zach Wierenski because that name is... I'll say you have a lot of talented. You're a really talented guy, but for you to be a play-by-play announcer... I, I've Impossible. Not, you could. You, you just ha- would have to pick and choose your teams. I'd be the in-between-the-benches guy. That is the only thing I could do. You'd excel at that. No Columbus games. Oh, I'm sure there's a bajillion other teams. Boudreaux's with- not in the league right now, so you're all right there. God help us if he ever becomes a Red Wings coach. (laughs) Anyhow, Zach Wierenski went down and, man, the way he froze James Reimer on that shot, it was actually funny. Like, he did that thing that shooters Made him look like Austin Matthews. (laughs) He essentially shot early, which is a move that shooters do when they're coming down because they see where the goalie is in, in coming out and getting set. And pretty much you shoot off rhythm in terms of what the goal is expecting and they have to scramble to move. But sometimes you do it, you catch them so good that the goalie just, it looks like they're a shooter tutor and they don't move. And that's exactly what happened to Reimer. And I just went, oh my God. But it was good, a good warm up because of the string of breakaways that were going to follow that one. Reimer stopped the next one. Because of a Patrick Kane giveaway. Yeah. On almost the exact same move, shot, whatever you want to call it. But Reimer moved on that one. Now, he didn't move to stop it. It just kind of hit him. But at least the reaction time was better. 
You know what? You know our, our motto for the entire win streak where some of the wins were ugly and some of the wins had to happen in like glorious, dramatic fashion. And we were just saying just win, hashtag just win. That is James Reimer as a goalie. Because of the two Red Wings goalies right now, he is the better one. He is playing better than Alex Lyon, but it's not like he is playing as well as Alex Lyon was when he was on fire. James Reimer is just, you're watching him and you're like, this is terrible. Oh, he won the game. And he had a 914 save for like that, like, He gets it done. <laughs> there was a save early on in the game where they were trying to bank the puck off the back of him and hit one leg was on one side of the post and one leg was on the other side of the post. Like the net was in between his legs and he was like contorting and had his glove behind him. I was like, James Reimer, make one normal save challenge, please. But I, dare I say Hasek esque? <laughs> you dare not. But you know what? He's getting the job done right now. So that's why this can be funny. Anyhow, he stopped the next breakaway. The Red Wings did nothing on a, a power play. Taxi came out of the box, went on a breakaway, and scored. And it was two nothing. Same spot. Yes. Again, they were very. They were <laughs> shooting for a single spot for sure. Oh, a hundred percent. The book on Rhymer's got to be high glove because they were shooting there almost exclusively for a good stretch of time. It looked like. The game goes to intermission, and it was like the Red Wings fans were booing, and you said something funny, Brad. The only thing that was wrong with that is they should have been booing louder. Like it, sickness, injury, whatever aside, like that was that was just like unacceptable. Even after the game, like Derek Lalonde, he gave the team credit for rallying back, but he's like that that start just didn't make sense. Like we've been talking about this, like that that was insane, and. You said, Brad, like this is a turning point for the season. How they come out after this is mathematics out the window, like the standings out the window. Like if you can't turn around against the Columbus Blue Jackets and put together a better effort for 40 minutes and play how you should be able to against them, then, you know, it's a big what are we doing here moment. And the team very obviously, you know, got their crap together at intermission because they came out in the second period and you were like, that that's the hockey we've been missing. It was better, far from perfect. But uh, you don't care about far from they're like that. That hockey is perfectly acceptable considering the injuries, considering whatever flu going around, considering Larkin out, considering you have James Reimer in net. Like that, that level of hockey, I was like, that's fine. Well, the cadence of the game in terms of how that went was super, super weird to me because yeah, they came out of first intermission much, much better. You could still see there was a handful of passengers on the ice. I'm going to guess if being nice, they were the ones who were under the weather. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll give it the benefit of the doubt. And then had a good second period, tied the game, which we'll get into. But then they came out completely flat the first 10 minutes of the third period again. Like you're tied going into the third and your biggest game of the season flat. And then the last five minutes of the game, phenomenal. Like pinned Columbus in their zone the whole time winning every battle, winning every race to a puck. You could see there was a sense of urgency, finally, and give a damn level. And again, it's kind of those catch-22s where you're like, I'm happy I'm finally seeing this, but I'm wondering why the hell I didn't see this the other 55 minutes of the game. Baby steps, Brad. I know. Take what you can get. The Red Wings, by five minutes into the second period, had the game tied first. Lucas Raymond scored the first goal, and, you know, much like... The other night where he scored a goal and ultimately didn't end up, the Red Wings didn't end up winning. But the the relief that kind of came forward when Lucas Raymond scored that goal was just puts himself in front. Great play by Kane to Fabry. Fabry right away to Raymond in the middle. I think Kane joked after the game saying, if you keep scoring from there, they're going to keep putting you there. So be careful. But it, Raymond's been money from there. Scored on the power play, got things going. You know, Raymond really led the charge in my mind. And then Detroit... By God, finally got some puck luck a couple minutes later. Mort Sider shot from the point, essentially was kicked in by Good Branson, was it? Yep. And it was a fortunate goal, but it's the kind of bounce that you needed. So just like that, the Red Wings had tied the game. And you were watching, and you're like, if they keep playing like that the rest of the game, this should come through. And aside from what Brad mentioned in terms of effort and you know it being kind of up and down, the killer was in the third period where Marchenko scored on the power play. And the shot that beat Reimer was, you know, a goalie's going to let in soft goals. Uh, If you're not a team with Connor Hellebuck or you're not a team with, you know, Swayman and Allmark or or whatever, you're going to have an average goal and he's going to let in soft goals from time to time. That's perfectly reasonable to expect. 
you know, we harp on James Reimer, but he's been the one winning games. And he let in an extremely soft goal on that right side, his glove hand. Glove side, yep. And you watch that and you're like, effort be damned, that one's killer. Like that just, that sucks. And how the Red Wings responded to me was going to dictate what I felt about the game afterwards. Because we've seen them crumple. We've seen them completely deflate after that. But to their credit, they were actually putting up sustained effort after. They had a few chances that I think should have gone in. They had a few chances where I think the goalie just made a fantastic save. And it wasn't until 13, actually 12.6 seconds left in the game where after a timeout, Lucas Raymond saved. Maybe call us dramatic. I don't think you were crazy for saying it, Brad. Maybe saved the season. Yeah, if you lose at home to Columbus with all the circumstances we've already laid out, mathematically you're still alive, obviously, but that would have been a backbreaker. That would have been the, there's no way this team beats anybody else. If you can't beat Columbus at home in this situation with their injuries, you're not beating anyone. You're We're looking at draft lottery at that point. We're talking about Zeev Bouillon today. Honestly, and you know, it, it could have accidentally turned into the best thing that happened to them because in a game where they realistically should have pounded Columbus and it been a pretty uneventful third period because they should have been up by several goals in a normal world with normal effort. All of a sudden now we have these two huge rallying moments Yeah, where momentum is at a level and vibes are at a level we haven't seen in about three weeks. What do you think? Should we just go all positive, like high sky high vibes the rest of the episode, Evan? Just like completely boundless positive energy again? Or <laughs> <laughs> I know we talked about this slightly in the group chat last night as the game was happening, and it's like That's a gentle way to put it, yeah. Now it's like my whole feeling right now is am I ready to be hurt again? <laughs> That's where I'm at. <laughs> but I'm a big believer, like very obviously what ails this team is actually what ails this team is ailments. First and foremost, both of like the, the illness and the injury variety. But what also ails this team is the confidence and the belief in themselves that they could get to the, the level that they were at before. So the way they won this game, which we'll talk about in a second, but the way they won it, yeah, I think it can be a rallying cry. Because after Lucas Raymond saves the game at a minimum and absolutely Detroit's playoff chances in all reality – not even a minute in, Patrick Kane comes down. Mo Sider gives him the puck and then runs a, we'll call it a smart pick. I saw, I, I didn't even notice it that much at first just because of the, the hype of the moment, but a lot of Columbus fans were mad and they pointed it out. And I was like, oh yeah, that was uh, that was some smart old school Red Wings interference run by Mo Sider. Refs don't call penalties in OT. It's, it's the right play to make. Patrick Kane fires at home, another OT winner, another classic Ken Daniels. Uh, goal call on a Patrick Kane overtime showtime moment like the hype was through the roof on that one and was it the prettiest win no but was that more exciting and potentially more impactful than you know Red Wings win 4-2 actually yeah yeah it's any excuse you have as a hockey player to have a rallying point take it and it's not nothing that you have that moment to end the game on Tuesday. And then on Thursday, you have easily the biggest game of your season to this point. Which may be outdone by the next game. In, or in, which may be done by the Washington game not long after that. Yeah, their next three games. Islanders, a direct opponent for that last playoff spot. Three points apart. Maybe one of the hottest teams in the league on Saturday in Nashville. And then the game after that, oh, Washington, the team that could leapfrog Detroit based on games played and points percentage. So the Leafs are about to play Washington tonight, so we'll have a better picture by the time you're listening to this. But the games in hand Washington has almost don't matter because that game is going to be the swing. So the Red Wings go two of three in their next three. That's acceptable. But the loss better be Nashville. It has to be. So that overtime goal officially Kane from Debrinket Insider. Lucas Raymond ends with two goals, including the the first goal to let everyone breathe and the tying goal. Patrick Kane ends up with a, a goal and two assists. What a like what a phenomenal result after what a horrific start. And the Red Wings pull out the two points against the Blue Jackets in overtime. In there, Lucas Raymond 
put himself on a five game goal streak, which I'm looking at the company he has five game goal streaks before their 22nd birthday. Norm Allman, Steve Eisenman, Steve Eisenman, Steve Eisenman, and Lucas Raymond. <laughs> it's a good company. It's crazy how there are three guys with the same name. <laughs> if, if we could have three Steve Eismans on the Red Wings, they, some, they would have won a lot more. Have you been paying attention to the draft boards? Non-zero chance we end up with another Eiserman next year. We're just calling him Steve, right? Yeah. Like that's his nickname is going to be is Steve? A hundred percent his nickname is going to be Steve. <laughs> that was the heart attacks were so real. I looked at Mel after that. I was like, that was probably the ugliest and most beautiful game of the season so far and saved and salvaged everything. I need to like maybe next year do like being an undercover agent for Colorado or Vegas just to see what it's like, you know, what is, what is their day to day or game to game as a fan's life? Like, Oh, Kale McCarr is really struggling right now. He's only at 8.8 points per game in this last yeah, yeah. game stretch. Yeah. He's only got two hat tricks or something like that. See what that's like, because I feel like I haven't done that in 10 years. Well, longer than that. All right. Before we talk about specific players, I want to talk about Raymond and Edvinson here. Uh, we'll talk about what's upcoming for Detroit. As Brad mentioned, they have the Islanders game on Thursday night in Detroit, 7 p.m. Eastern. That is massive for obvious reasons. The Islanders lost last night. And the fact that the Red Wings could pull out the win on a night where the Islanders lost again. Patrick Waugh, what's going on, buddy? That was huge because they've squandered a couple of those opportunities. On Saturday, they have Nashville on the road, 5 p.m. Eastern. We'll be back with you on Sunday. And then their next game after that is the really big one, the Washington Capitals on the road, 7 p.m. Eastern. So we'll have an episode for you after the Islanders and the Nashville games. As of the time of recording, the playoff race, Detroit currently holds that second wildcard position. The Toronto-Washington game hasn't been played yet. Detroit obviously needs Toronto to win, so hold your breath. Ew. Yeah, you have to cheer for the Leafs on that one. The Capitals are one point back of the Detroit Red Wings, but they have two games in hand. Detroit has 76 to Washington's 75 points. The Islanders are three points back, and they only have one game in hand on Detroit. So even if they win that game, Detroit still hasn't beat on points. And in terms of the regulation wins tiebreaker, Detroit has 24, Washington has 27, and the Islanders have 21. So that's where everyone is in that mix. And if you're still looking at Tampa Bay, they have one fewer game played than Detroit, so a game in hand, and they're four points up. So not exactly within Detroit's range right now, but not completely out of range. And on the same vein, the Buffalo Sabres have one more game played than Detroit, and they have 71 points, so they're five points back. So this is narrowing down to three-ish teams fighting for one spot, Detroit, Washington, and the Islanders, but I wouldn't put the Sabres out. I wouldn't put the Devils out quite yet. And really, even though it's not trending in the right direction, Pittsburgh either mathematically, and you never know what happens with Tampa, but that's in general, it's Detroit, Washington Islanders, and that's what they have to focus on. Don't, don't rule out Philly because that's right. Yeah. In looking at Philly in the Metro, it's relevant because the two realistic teams challenging Detroit for the last playoff spot are both in the Metro. So the math is basically Detroit just has to finish ahead of Two of those three teams. Yeah. And Philly right now has the same amount of games played, 69. Nice. And they have two more points. They're at 78 points to Detroit's 76. So this is, I mean, we we joked last episode, would you want to see a play-in of these teams? Not the way they're playing right now, but Detroit does have a lot of Metro teams around them. Well, looking out into April, the last little stretch here for the Red Wings, there's some huge games in April, too. This is still going to be a race down to the wire. Like, April 1st, they've got the Lightning, so maybe they make up some ground there. Then on the 7th, they play the Sabres. The 9th, they play the Capitals. The 11th, they play Pittsburgh. So the season is going to wrap up sometime around there. It's it's crazy, the, the race that's happening all the way to the wire this year. Unless something dramatic happens like we've seen the last 10 games in a negative way, or, you know, the previous two months before that in a positive way. Yeah. This, there will be no mathematical certainties until very, very, very late in the season, which we're not going to rehash all of that. It's surprising that it's this close right now, but Hey, we'll take it. Okay. I want to give Lucas Raymond more time. Ken was right. Absolutely. Everybody loves Raymond right now. Happy belated birthday to Ken Daniels, by the way. Hope 35 is good for you. Lucas Raymond 
elevating his game. We've done, this is like probably our third specific segment on it, but he deserves 10. This whole team is in the gutter right now. Their best players aren't coming through. Kane is on a five game point streak right now, but even he hasn't been as impactful as he was before. Like the loss of Larkin has been so noticeable. And anytime that happens, you're thinking, oh, you know, Lucas Raymond of old, he, he might struggle. He might not have as much support. You worry about how his development's going to continue. Not only has he can, maintained his remarkable play that he's had all season, he's elevated himself. Like he's driving play. He's coming up huge in specific moments. He's pumped up. Like he is the leader of this team and the one coming through for them. When if he didn't, it would be lights out for Detroit. Youngest player on the team, at least before Edmondson came up driving the bus, being the leader they need. And it's not just that he's been putting up points. Even if you look at the game last night, there were a few shifts, more than a few, where he wasn't rewarded with a goal, but he dominated the play, dominated the puck, was making everything happen. And you're watching his line mates just try to keep up with him. It's it's sad, but almost impressive at the same time, just because of how good Raymond was at controlling the play. Lucas Raymond starts next season with an A on his jersey, right? He better after this stretch. Yeah. He depends won't. on who's gone, but he'll he'll eventually have one. He'll absolutely eventually have one. The other two assistant captains have what? Two and three years left on their contracts, respectively. This team, this is Larkin's team, obviously, but you can see the future of this team. This is Raymond. Right now, this is Raymond and Moe's team. Like this is Lucas Raymond and Mo Sider, and right now Lucas Raymond is is the talk of the town. His, you're completely right, Brad, in the way that he's kind of dominated those shifts. It's not just like he was right place, right time. Like he probably could have had two, three more points. Obviously, it never really happens that way for any given player. But the way he was dominating the ice, a lot of that pressure was driven by him. And even in previous games, when Detroit wasn't having sustained pressure, a lot of the pressure that they were able to manage in spurts was driven by him. So. We're watching a star be born. I think Prashant said like Detroit has a superstar in their hands. I think it's perfectly within range for, you know, what Lucas Raymond could turn into in his career. We are seeing the highest of the high end. What would the best version of Lucas Raymond's third season be play out right now? Like we talked about that all off season. How can Lucas Raymond take the big step after, you know, a very typical sophomore slump? What eventualities outcomes could could come into play realistically, this is the top or the furthest end of that spectrum so far. Imagine if we injected more Lucas Raymonds into the lineup, how much even more impactful and how much further Lucas Raymond could really push his production. I'll just go to my Lucas Raymond tree. I'll I'll grab a couple more. Would you? Bring them to Detroit, yeah. Just an entire forward group of sub-six-foot Lucas Raymonds. I'm here for it. Short Kings Unite. Yeah. (laughs) The energy he has too, like right now, like the emotional leader of the Red Wings, like he is so pumped up every time he scores. I actually did notice it's the small things you notice sometimes that don't really seem like anything, but they're a pretty good indication of where some players are at. And I, I have to give one other player credit on this too, because he's not a guy you would think of. But when Patrick Kane scored the OT winner and, you know, everybody went to mob him. You would think the guys on the ice would get to him first, and I think DeBrinket or Sider, or whoever it was, did. You know who the first two guys off the bench were to get to him? Andrew Kopp, surprisingly. Doesn't strike me as the type, but it was good to see. And Lucas Raymond at yeah. 100 miles an hour was still fired up. I don't know how he had any energy left in him. But yeah, he right in the middle of it, as always. Big little brother energy. Lucas Raymond, man. Key to the city. Make him mayor. I don't care. But I like... The, the Red Wings right now have him to thank for where they're at. I think, yeah, Larkin is this team's MVP, but if, if Detroit gets this done, if they win this fight in the mud with all the other teams and, and find themselves in a playoff spot, he's the top of the list for me as to why. Simon Edvinson. Obviously, the storyline of the game was Lucas Raymond saving the game, Patrick Kane sealing the game. Simon Edvinson, though, I felt, you know, came up, had altogether a really... Like a lot of positives to be drawn from that game. Played about 18 minutes, played in the top four, got some PK time. I, I saw some, you know, good breakout passes. I saw him demonstrate some patience with the puck and, and skill with the puck. Well, it wasn't a perfect game, but 
you know, he has to like, he, he had to find his legs a little bit. He got with the pace after a little while. I saw a lot of good things from Simon Edvinson and they gave, he gave Detroit, you know, a lot of calm that game, which I think was important. I didn't really notice him for large stretches of the game, which compared to what we're used to was a breath of fresh air. He was solid, calm, not a tire fire. You could see as the game went on, he he got more confident with the puck on his stick and he wasn't doing anything flashy with it, but he was using his reach, using his body, waiting for stuff to open up in front of him, wasn't rushing plays and was able to make a lot of really, really solid passes because of it. And yeah, it was pretty much what we expected. He came up, didn't kick the barn doors down, but definitely was an upgrade on other players who have been playing around that spot this season. He had the third most uh, minutes played of defensemen too, so that's a big tell in the coaching staff and how they like his game. <laughs> that's a big task. I mean, it is Columbus, but everybody, the Red Wings playing anybody right now is a tough task. So for him to come up, play 18 and a half-ish minutes and, you know, look the way he did, which and I thought, like you guys said, not super noticeable, but you know, made the right plays. There were some great, he made some great outlet passes, which, you know, the bar is low when you're talking outlet passes. I thought mission accomplished for him last night. The only thing that I didn't like about Simon Edmondson's recall was because it was... Because it took too long? Because it, it took too long. and It was because of injury. I was hoping Edmondson could double as a message to the team. And again, we talk about that Grim Reaper meme going and knocking on each door, just one by one scratching the defensemen who haven't been pulling their weight and inserting him into their spot for a game. But, and it obviously sucks that Wallman's hurt, but hey, better late than never, I guess. And it's good to know that at least by our early, very small sample size, we weren't wrong to be calling for it. It's funny to me. So there was discourse online after about, after the game about Simon Edmondson and how he played. I don't know if people have just never watched Simon Edmondson play, but there was a lot of conversation about how long he holds the puck oh, on yeah. his stick. And I'm like, this is Simon Edmondson. That's what he is. This is what he's always done. And man, you would never know that there would be four checkers breathing down that guy's neck because he is just ice cold, calm, silky smooth. And he, I mean, that will burn you time to time at the NHL level, but to not freak out in the sense of pressure is is quite remarkable especially for someone his age he's also come a long way in that regard too. absolutely he used to hang on to it where the mistakes would come for like way more and he's worked on that but that part of why we were saying like get him up sooner is that kind of understanding of pace and space in the nhl you just can't really there's no better test than the actual nhl so you're right evan like it, it he'll get burned but he'll learn from that and that's why, you know, we've been saying it's better to have Edvinson make this mistake than Petrie because at least Edvinson will learn from it. And he has like you have to build him that runway, which is why I hope even though he came up for injury that they find a way to factor him into the lineup because I want him to get that runway. Not because, you know, th- this playoff push is where you want to be making mistakes, but because I think he did one really well. I think the confidence will come fast. We saw it come over the course of one game. And I think he, right now he makes this defensive group better. Plain and, and simple. And the Red Wings have the excuse, at least, it's not a good thing, but they have the excuse of, yeah, he's going to make mistakes, but so are the veterans, and they're making more, at least compared to this small sample size. So inexperience, not really a factor at the current moment of in time or the state of the team. I'll certainly be continuing to watch the amount of minutes he's playing, should he be playing more games. Because if he if he was just a roster filler for an injured guy, you know, you'd think he'd get fourteen, ten to fourteen minutes, you know, just fill in, be a minute muncher where needed. But man, when like I said, he was a th- played the third most minutes of anyone on defense last night. They clearly are relying him, and there's clearly a, a sense of belief in his game. So that's a great sign for me. Once people start to get healthy, though. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I used to make predictions based on what you thought made sense, but based on how the whole season has gone, I just, we'll see what happens. I will say, I think Simon Edvinson showed enough in that game to to say, yep, this is worth continuing this experiment. And you know what? If guys are banged up, 
maybe they sit because they're banged up, but maybe it's also like they could play and, and part of it is message sending as well. So it, it could be both sides of the coin in, in terms of what you're referring to, Brad. I'd rather see guys take an extra game off right now if mm-hmm. Simon Edvinson is the person slotting in. You know, if it's Brogan Rafferty, and no offense to Brogan Rafferty, but if he's the guy slotting in, I'm like, we need someone back immediately. You need to rush through your 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 healing process and get back in the lineup. Yeah. But when it's Simon Edvinson, you know, a guy who you're certainly looking to for the future, I'm okay with guys taking an extra game to, you know, get themselves to be 100% because the Red Wings don't need guys coming in right now at 75% and then looking the way some of them have game after game lately. All right, a couple quick updates before we jump into a break here. Uh, Dylan Larkin is practicing. It's uncertain whether he's going to play on Thursday night, so maybe by the time you listen you'll know, but it looks like he's getting close enough where it's a possibility. They'll know more on Thursday They didn't seem too confident before. After practice today, maybe a little less unconfident. I would imagine Saturday, by Saturday, we should see him, but it's all been, this doesn't seem like a light injury based on how, obviously, how long Dylan Larkin's been out. So I would think that he's trying his best to come back based on how badly the team needs him. And man, could they use him for the Islanders game? But it's very much a maybe for now. And uh, for next game, the goaltender net will be James Reimer. That's the right call. He's getting it done right now. Is it pretty? No. Is it perfect? Far from it. But it's working more than Lion is right now, or it's at least less bad than Lion is right now. So you'll roll with Reimer. You see what you get. Hell yeah, baby. Roll with Reimer. Print it. (laughs) Whatever it takes, just win. Do what you need to do. All right. We are going to, in a moment here, I'll be back with you to talk to Max Boltman. But for now, we're going to take a quick break to let you know that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by Labatt Blue Light. Created in 1983, this premium light Canadian Pilsner is a delicately balanced beer brewed with Cascade hops and a blend of malt. It's fresh, crisp, and brewed to the highest quality standards. There's a little bit of Canadian kindness in every sip of Labatt Blue Light. How did it get in there? They're Canadian. That's how. You can spread the love yourself by sharing a Labatt. And when you do share a Labatt, you're not just sharing a beer. You're sharing an experience that'll pair with anything from hockey to a hoedown. So next time you're watching a hockey with your buds, be sure to share Labatt because while you might not all root for the same team, although we on this podcast do hope you're rooting for the Red Wings, you can all enjoy a Labatt Blue Light. We honestly love going to games in Detroit and seeing Labatt being the beer that fans clamor for all over the arena. It's a reliable beer and great to have in your hand when celebrating a goal. So Head to the link in the description of this episode or the one you see on your screen to find Labatt in stores near you today. You must be 21 or older, and as always, enjoy responsibly. All right, we're going to jump into our conversation with Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit. Credit to Max for taking the time this morning to to chat with us after that game. Talk about what's coming up for Detroit is in terms of their schedule, their playoff push, and also what's going to come up this offseason, you know, what Eisman's going to do, what's been happening with Derek Lalonde's squad and more. So without further ado, Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit. Enjoy. I wanted to be known before we start that Max committed to this interview after the first period yesterday, after Detroit was down 2 nothing, and the full expectation was that I was asking him to throw me a lifeline because this episode was going to be, there's going to be some hurt. So the fortunes change, and i that's all in your court, Max. So you're, you're the one who brought the good karma yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's going to be that much more positive of a show than it would have been otherwise, <laughs> to be honest. But it, it'll, it'll reach a sufficient standard, I hope. Uh, in any case, welcome uh, Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit back to the show. Max, appreciate you coming on. And uh, you joked before we started that this is going to be the complete opposite of the tone we had the last time you were on pre-trade deadline when the Red Wings were amidst their winning streak. Yeah, I don't know if that was a joke either. <laughs> um, that that was as positive as uh, you and I have been together on this show. I don't think this will be as negative if we've ever, as we've ever been, but it's not going to be... It, there's not too much happy to talk about, right? Unless we're talking about Lucas Raymond. There's going to be a healthy amount of, you know, Lucas Raymond talk and then the specific moment of the Kane OT winner. But why don't we just talk broad strokes here, where the Red Wings were when we spoke last, you know, talking trade deadline, all their options. This looks like a playoff team, et cetera, et cetera. 
to where they are now, which is they miraculously pulled out two points against one of the worst teams in the league, and they still need Washington to get beat up in their upcoming games to have a chance at the playoffs anymore. Yeah, quite the whiplash, right? It's uh, I think there was a degree of this that was expected, right? Even when like, when Dylan Larkin goes out, you know, I, I know obviously that's a significant injury, and I think we all expected it to have a big toll. I just don't think anyone expected the depths that it hit. And there's just a few instances of specific games in there that you can pick out and say, but did you need, did you really need to be at full strength for this one? Did you really need to be at full strength for this one? I think we can look at both the Arizona games. I think the game in Buffalo and certainly the first period of last night's game, which, you know, they get the two points out of, they steal the two points out of. All of those games are games that I walked into the building thinking, all right, well, they'll get, they'll get this one and that'll, you know, kind of give them a life raft, keep them afloat and, and we'll see what happens. Last night was the most like glaring of, of just like, you're talking to people up in the press box and like, what do you, what can you attribute something like that to? Like at, at least Buffalo, it's like, yeah, they're a young, fast team. And, and even to an extent with Arizona, with Cooley and Genther and, and, you know, Keller um it's I don't mean any disrespect to Columbus but that's not a team that has very much to play for it's not a team that has very much like pop that you're like oh well that you know how are they going to keep up with Logan Cooley Clayton Keller right like it Tage Thompson that you can't really say those things about Columbus um even though I think they were all right in the same little cluster in the standings and it was just mystifying to see it play out that way and and if it was a one-off, you know, then you'd say, okay, well, three games and four nights and all that. But it's just, it's like the fourth, how, how long has it been since those games I just said? Is it, it has been less than two weeks, those four games in there? Yeah. And it's just over and over. And every time you think that they're coming out of it, something happens. So they won last night. I'd certainly say that was their most emotional win since probably the Kane OT winner in Chicago. Um Maybe that does spark something for them. Um, to your point, you know, they've kind of lost the control of their own destiny, but they're close enough to it with a game head to head against Washington that they kind of do. They, they kind of need to just go. I don't know if it's nine and four. I don't know if it's eight and five the rest of the way somewhere in that sweet spot. And that's within their capacity. It's within their capability. It's just gotten a lot harder. I, I would have told you with a bullet three, even two weeks ago, even coming off of the, their loss in Colorado, I would have told you absolutely they can, they can do that down the stretch. And now I, I feel like we're having to relearn this team and, and Dylan Larkin will come back and that's something, but it's, it's been really interesting. No, I think mystifying was a really good word to use because it's not about oh, we said they're going to make the playoffs and now we're scrambling to justify why we were wrong. Like We always said anything can happen. This is hockey. It's not the NBA. It's a pretty wild sport where those kinds of, of streaks can happen. And it's less about the results, even though at one point it looked like they were going to lose 9 of 10 and that's terrible. And it's more about the what we're seeing. You know, there's a broader narrative across, you know, the, the hockey media world as everyone's paying attention to this pretty catastrophic collapse by the Red Wings. And the, somewhat fairly people are pointing to the fact that yeah hey this is what this team has always been if you look at you know their underlying numbers and how they've been achieving success and, and you know i'm not trying to take shots at anyone but i just can't help but feel like watching these games and covering every game as you do too th that feels like a cheap way out of that conversation because what we're watching on the ice right now is not even remotely similar to the hockey they were playing before even when you know, Alex Lyon was goalieing teams and Detroit was pulling these like magical storybook moments out of nowhere and they were high efficiency shooting. Everything outside of that, they were still playing like a completely different team than right now. So yeah, you remove Larkin, that's going to hurt things. Yeah, the goalies go cold, that's going to hurt things. But it's still, and I'm just kind of reiterating your point here, it still feels to me like none of that is explained by what's uh, being propped up as an easy answer uh, from kind of the outside the Red Wings sphere. I agree with you. I, I, I think that it's, it's certainly possible that if you look at just raw data points, right? Like raw, raw expected goals, averages and shares and all that, that, that this isn't that different. That might be the case. Um, it looks 
night and day different. And that's not, we're not just talking about pucks going in nets or not going in nets. Like the flow of play, I, I felt like the Red Wings were consistently on top of opponents. Maybe not, I, I in, in January, early January, I didn't think they were playing like amazing hockey and they were getting results. So there's stretches in there where they were playing poorly and getting results for sure. There have also been games this year where they've played well and not gotten results. But, uh, I, I just don't see this as simple. Yeah. Well, you, you rode the PDO train and now the PDO train runs you over. I, that's just not what I'm looking at. You know, I mean, I, I, they, the data may say that's exactly what's happening. And sometimes you have to, you do have to realize that your lie, your, your eyes tell you lies sometimes. I just don't think after watching nearly 70 games of this team that, uh, that, that, that it's that simple. So, um, what is it? I like a bunch of things. I, I, I know that's like kind of the natural follow up answer. Dylan Larkin is a part of it. Playing a lot of these games on the road without Dylan Larkin specifically is a part of it. I've mentioned that a couple of times. And I, I think Lalone actually mentioned in his press conference last night of just like how much easier they are to match up with when you don't have the last change and, and you don't have Dylan Larkin to go with. Like you just become so easy to, okay, put your checker on. Caden to bring it. They're not going to win that battle. Put your stars on Confer and Raymond. You're probably taking, um, that battle, but if at worst, you're probably getting a wash, uh, and then you're going to win elsewhere in the lineup. And so like, it, that's part of it for sure. But I also think a big part of it is this kind of psychological side where you, you hear Ben Sherratt talk about them getting deflated when they go down a goal. You definitely see that, right? Like, I, I don't know what the data points on it are, but I see that. I see the body language of that uh, every time it happens. Um, you see the way that they have started games. I I don't always think it's so simple as they're not ready to play. And this is where, like, I think I know people really want to take this hard and say it's coaching, light a fire. If you go back and you just isolate, like, and I maybe this is – I don't know what the, what the correct sample on this kind of thing is. Isolate the first like two, three, four shifts. I think the Red Wings, the last four or so of, of these games, which is when it, the boiling point has really happened. Most of them, I don't necessarily think it, it's certainly not in Columbus, but the, the home Arizona game, the home Buffalo game, the road Pittsburgh game at a minimum. And I also think the Vegas game, you go to those and, and maybe even the Buffalo game. Now that I think about it, I don't really remember. Um, you go isolate those first three, four shifts, and they kind of hit the ground with a little bit of jump. Every single one of those instances, they torpedo themselves. It's penalties, it's turnovers, whatever it might be. And then it shifts. And that tells me that it's a psychological thing that's happening shortly after the start of the game, but not like you didn't come to puck drop awake, right? And I think the narrative is they're starting these games so late. That was the case against Columbus, no doubt. They started the game late. But it, so that I think is interesting too. And I think it just speaks to kind of the psychological side of this that, you know, whatever is happening is happening upstairs. Um, meaning between the ears, not, you know, in the press box, but maybe also in the press box. Who knows? So let's get into some, let's talk about the positives that people are riding on. First and foremost, we're watching Lucas Raymond probably do the most unexpected thing through all of this. Like within the context of how the Red Wings were floundering, as you just described, Lucas Raymond has not just been their most consistent player, but it looks like he even elevated his game from already a really high level this year. And obviously last night was a, a cap or a cherry on top of that story so far. Has he taken, you know, the next step to be a bona fide star and, and how much has he changed even the contract conversations between him and Detroit? Yes. Um, Yes, he has taken the step. He's, I don't know if he's going to hit 70 points this year, but he's going to make a run at it. Um, he, he looks like a legit top line driver. And obviously he's playing on the second line, which Detroit needs him to do because they need someone to drive that second line. But in terms of caliber of player, like he's, he has taken that step. It reminds me of Dylan Larkin in the, in the 1819 and 1920 seasons where he's, a lot of nights kind of willing them into and, and through games. Um, I, you know, it is always a team thing. It is impossible to win a hockey game on the back of one person. And that's why it was, it's always been unfair to, I think, judge Dylan Larkin on, you know, his capabilities based on what he was able to do 
on some of those teams. But, and so in this case, like, it's not just Lucas Raymond who is responsible for the Red Wings, like winning a couple games here, but he has been the most consistent driving force, the most consistent reason for success when they've had success, which has not been that often, but even that they've been in some of these it has been a huge credit to him. Um, and I think it's, it's the way that, you know, we talked about it early in the season, the strength and all that stuff. This, I think goes beyond that. This, I think is a, is a mental thing, a, a kind of conscious decision to, get to certain parts of the ice where, where the battles are decided. Right. And we've talked about the Red Wings having maybe too many kind of small skill offensive wingers, maybe not star level, right? Like they're not all Patrick Kane and Alex to but they do have a Patrick Kane and an Alex to And they have some guys who chip in offense from the wings. I think they too often have lacked the guys who can win battles in hard areas of the ice. And I think it's why they've leaned on a guy like David Perron, who does that, you know, maybe doesn't get around the ice very well otherwise, but when he's in those hard areas, he wins and, and they've needed more of that. And Lucas Raymond decided seemingly that he's going to be both, right? He's going to be a 30 goal scorer and a 65 point player. And he's going to win those pucks. And actually the second is leading to the former there. Um, I think he's been excellent. You talk about the contract. Absolutely. I think the, the price of the, of Lucas Raymond has gone up, right? But, uh, I think that's a better problem for the Red Wings to have than the alternative. Kind of out, Sean, and, and just not really in the narrative after the game because everyone was talking about Raymond and then obviously Kane's winner, which, I don't know, was that 100 overtime winners for him this season? Uh, Simon Edvinson, I felt, had a good night. He was called up. Jake Wallman sat out hurt, and you know the whole team is kind of banged up, sick, etc. So we've seen Beargren come up, and we saw Edvinson come up again last night. To me, he looked steady all things considered i think he had a lot of positives to draw from his game what did you make of edvinson's uh, i think about around 18 minutes last night yeah and i think it speaks to what you're talking about that i didn't feel like 18 minutes to me watching at, at one point we were up in the press box you know five minutes in the third you know how much do you think edvinson's played tonight i'll, I'll, I'll go check and i kind of thought right around 10 and it was almost 14 and by the end it's 18 and that's not because you didn't notice him. I thought there were actually two or three different instances where he made a pass that I don't know that we've seen Red Wings defensemen consistently connect on this year. Gosses Bear has done a few kind of stretch passes, especially through seams through the middle, um, that Edvinson made. Um, they don't always lead to a huge play. There was one to Sprong that I thought was going to lead to a breakaway that I don't know if the pass just missed or if Sprong couldn't quite get his stick on it or what, but, um, there were a few of them and, and I thought, you know, okay, that's, that's what you want to see. But most importantly is you didn't see many mistakes from Edvinson. I, I know Lalone in his post game talked about the play that, um, he had good draw on him and kind of held on to the puck, but he did hold on to the puck, right? Like maybe it's not something he can get away with, you know, the next 10 times he does it, but he did get away with it. And I, I am always impressed at how he can be kind of a one man breakout in that regard. Maybe he should not count on being able to always be a one man breakout, but he can sometimes. And, and he was there, um, and, and just really steady, right? Like I thought he, he covered his spots. You know, there was a nice uh, play where he defending the rush as thought had took the right man. And then he dropped back into coverage blocks a shot and they get going the other direction. Like there's just a lot of positive when, when you roll back that game on Simon Edvinson, a lot of quiet. And I think that's maybe the most important thing he should have, he could have shown the Red Wings is that he's, he can give them those games, which they're going to need down the stretch here. They're, uh, they're, they need everything they can get from him, obviously. But I think if you gave him the choice, they would take trustworthy for this stretch of games over, uh, maybe trying to be game breaking, but maybe accidentally breaking it both ways, which can happen. So after last time we recorded, it was pre-trade deadline. And uh, as we were wrapping up after we hit stop on the recording, you know, we were talking and you said, by the way, we're going to, you know, do something right after the deadline, right? To, to recap what the Red Wings do or don't do. And I was like, yeah, obviously. Uh, and unfortunately the Red Wings kind of torched those plans because the losing a bunch has, has been the story in hockey town. But let's jump into, you know, the deadline and then really attach to that is what's coming up for the roster management in this offseason. What do you make of the lack of moves? Uh, it was just trading cost and really to to offload cap. And then what's coming up for Detroit in the offseason? We touched on it a little bit with Raymond's contract. We were talking in the chat this morning. Is Sider's contract going to be attached to that in value in any way? What's looming for you? 
It's a big summer. Um, what do I make of the lack of moves? I, in the end, I think this kind of almost justifies a lack of moves. I mean, if anything, that you know, you make me argue, could you have sold? Um, but I think this kind of justifies it, right? Like I, the the kind of guys that I was talking about them going and getting were like a Wenberg or a Dowd, and I don't think maybe you win one more game than you did if you if you in that stretch if you have one of those two guys around. And and I still maintain that both those guys are the type that would help you in the playoffs. But I don't think any of them are replacing Dylan Larkin. And I think that's been the biggest reason for the fall. So um in that way I, I think ultimately it's probably I guess we did talk about goalies a little bit. And I I we were texting about this. I know you guys had a, a thing on it in the last show about what should they do in goal? I do think the more that we see this team, the more I believe that it's the kind of team that needs an elite goaltender um, to kind of, you know, carry the the load like that, right? And I I talked about like I I know Winnipeg does have some some stars on their team. Certainly, I think the Red Wings have some stars on their team, but Connor Hellebuck is what makes the Winnipeg Jets in my mind, and. I don't, you can't just go get Connor Hellebuck. I guess you could have if he was going to become a free agent this year, which at a time it looked like he was. Yeah. But you can get, I think, a, there there is a unique opportunity this summer to add a top 10 caliber goalie. I know John Gibson was the guy you guys talked about in the last episode. At one point, John Gibson was that guy. I'm, I'm getting pretty skeptical of whether he still is based on what it's been in, in Anaheim. Obviously, a bad supporting cast, but, you know. Not does be the, much better here. <laughs> and does the great goalie just hibernate for four years like that, or does it yeah. eventually wear into you? Right? Like I don't know. Um, he's been a below nine hundred goalie the last two years. I would take a swing on a really top of the line goalie and see what happens. Right? And um, for me, I think that's Markstrom. But I know there's a cost associated there. But I do wonder if that's something they'll look at. Like I think. W- Every time that we've seen this team be really good, and I'm especially thinking of January and February, but you know, even uh, earlier in the season at, at times, good goaltending was a big part of that. Uh, great goaltending, I should say, not just like average. Like I'm saying, like bail you out goaltending. And I think when this team gets that, they play with confidence. They can play their game. So if they would have added Jacob Markstrom, I do kind of wonder, do they ac- actually win like three or four of these games that they lost? I don't know. I think so because, uh, like, I, the cascade effect of goalie bad team loses confidence. It's always a thing in the NHL, but with the Red Wings right now, where you can pick the exact po- moment where their heart rips in half, like every game. Yeah, I think that absolutely could have made a difference to the tune of five or six points over this. Which stretch. isn't us blaming the goal. Like, like the, there's no. obviously like up and down the team. Lion wasn't going to be nine twenty five all year. Exactly. It was just so. It's, so the 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 question isn't like, well, how come Lyon stopped save, playing at this like crazy top five? He was a top five goalie in the league for stretches there, right? And it just like it was never reasonable to ask that of him, right? Like, but he's a good player, right? Like he's mm-hmm. a good goalie, and I think they overworked him, but he is a good player. I, I think they absolutely should keep him around. It's just a matter of like. Okay, if if you needed a goalie to be playing top five, top ten level to do what you did, shouldn't you just go get a top five, top ten goalie, which in most years is like, oh, yeah, let me just go do that. Except there's like three of those known to be available right now. That just seems like a unique opportunity to me. You know, I was originally, I raised Markstrom, Brad raised Gibson, and I think you make a really good point about Gibson like it's been bad for a while and so it should make you nervous because how much does that bake in it's the most mental position in the most mental sport in professional sports so there's maybe it's a fresh start like that's possible could be and there's also the flip side to that is if Gibson's been bad for a while the acquisition cost isn't as high and you might even be able to get some retention there so I'm not sure that you want to (laughs) go um uh, value shopping when you're trying to get an elite goalie but I think there's a, you're right. There's a lot of opportunities no matter which path you go. And I just want to address one thing that I know a lot of people are yelling in their cars right now, which is, as you just said, it's not the goalie's fault. Like this defense yeah. needs fixing. It's needed fixing even when Detroit was good. We've seen that. Totally. But it's just, that's going to take a lot of doing and undoing. 
And I, I, it would be a monumental task for Steve Eisenman to fix that this summer. Like just shipping out one contract won't be enough. And really, you don't want to put all that weight on Simon Edmondson's lofty shoulders because he hasn't had the year to get the runway. Like if assuming, which I don't assume anything anymore, he starts next season. It's going to take some time for him to get settled in. Yes, absolutely. I, like, I just think the amount of time, the amount of moves that it takes to go from being kind of built like Detroit to being built like, let's say, Carolina, who's a team, a really good team that does not have a goalie, right, is more. There's It takes more moves than to, than to go from where Detroit is to being a team that's built – not exactly like Winnipeg, but more along the lines of Winnipeg. And, and it's, you know, it's not just in goal, but the other moves beyond goal would be shorter just because, not because like the gap in goal is so down. Again, I think Alex Lyon's a, a good player and, and at times he's been a really good player. And I think Vili Huso has shown good stretches. Um, and, and it is a good player. It's just a matter of that is the most impactful position in the sport. And if you transform that into being at this high level, how many, you know, the, how much of the Islanders uh, hanging around can be attributed to having one of the five best goalies in the sport in Ilya Sorokin, right? Like, I don't know. I, I just, uh, it's, it's probably, it's probably is oversimplistic, but it's just something that my mind's kind of been stuck on. It'll lead to more heart attack hockey to watch, which at least is exciting, but we'll probably need some blood pressure medication if you watch the Red Wings uh, long term. I'm not going to make you try to predict the future anymore, Max. I think that was a mistake last episode that you were on. So uh, <laughs> we'll say we're going to have you back soon once uh, a little bit more of what's upcoming for Detroit is illuminated. For now, folks, Max is covering every beat of the Detroit Red Wings playoff push here, high or low on the Athletic Detroit. Uh, go follow Max on Twitter or X, um, at M underscore Baltman. You'll see the links to his articles right on Twitter. Click on those and subscribe to The Athletic Detroit right from there. Uh, it's the best way to support Max, and I promise you that is the first thing uh, that I do, that Brad does, and if Evan could read, he would do. Uh, once Max's articles drop, his go read uh, his updates. So uh, M underscore Baltman on Twitter. Max Baltman of The Athletic Detroit. Max, thanks again, man. Appreciate you doing this in the morning. Absolutely, man. Appreciate you. Okay, welcome back. That was our conversation with Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit. I'm going to get this re-intro right this time, or otherwise I think Brad's going to punch me directly into the, in the nose. I don't know if he has the strength to. No, he's too feeble. If I moved that fast, <laughs> we I'd, know what would I'd have, <laughs> Every action ha has an equal and opposite reaction. <laughs> I would have a bigger problem on my hands. And so would you. Okay. Raymond and Sider contracts. I think there's been a paradigm shift. I think, and I think it's been a little unfair to most Sider because of what he's been asked to do on defense. And I think this is the exact reason why probably Lucas Raymond didn't want to sign after the last season because it was not his best season. And by waiting out, he drove his dollar value up. I think you're now maybe looking at a situation. You're never going to give a guy a contract based on, you know, a five game sample size or, or something like that. Like you're never that reactionary. That's not what you're going to do. Steve Eisenman is going to grind both guys, no matter what you've seen him do it. He did that with Dylan Larkin. But if you're Lucas Raymond right now, you're looking at the Matt Boldy contract as your floor. If you're going long-term. And I, I wonder if this is a situation where Steve Eisenman can't use that to his advantage because, you know, we've been talking about paying Mo Sider, Nine million, nine million plus on a long term deal because that's what you pay a one D. There's very few exceptions to that, but in general, if you're paying for that position, that's what you got to pay. But if Lucas Raymond's number is like say eight or eight point two five or eight point five or whatever it might be, is this a situation where Steve Eisman can say point to Lucas Raymond and say, you know, Mo, you, you're you're not going to make more than that. Look how he's producing and look at his impacts. Like you're both extremely important. You go hand in hand, you're actually like the future of this team. You're getting the same deal or a similar number to him. Is that just too galaxy brain for me? A little. Iserman's going to try it. Uh, Moe's agent is going to say no straight up. And, you know, Moe's got a bit longer of a track record of playing at the level he's playing at, whereas Raymond had a bit more of a down second year than Moe did. Also, Positional premium. 
right-handed defenseman versus a winger. Usage. Historically tough usage for Mo Sider at 22 years old too, which is going to factor into the conversation. So I understand the train of thought and I know a lot of teams like to have an internal cap and that's usually around their best player. So you look at Larkin's contract is what Eisenman is going to try to pitch. Yeah. I don't think it's going to work though. If this was a situation where Eisenman had Larkin, Sider, and Raymond all starting with eight on a long-term deal, that would be like a miraculous haul in my mind. That would be phenomenal. I just, especially when you look at comparables around the league, I have a really, really hard time seeing Mo come in under nine. It does open up conversations of, of do you consider shorter term deals? And the guys might want shorter term deals too. It, it, like a lot of this speculation, like, yeah, we joke. It's hard to know what Steve Eisman ever is doing, but it's also speculation because different players can have different priorities. Like some guys are like, Hey, hockey town's my home. I really like what we're building here. I want to be part of it for a long time. I want to take less money or I don't want to take less money, but I want this team to be successful. So I'm not going to grind for 300 grand more a year. And if you're going to promise me, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars for eight years, I'm going to take that. And some guys are like Austin Matthews where they're like, "Mm, three years is right for me right now. Mm, Five years walks me right to UFA or whatever it is. And I'm going to keep maximizing. From a pure labor standpoint, there's nothing wrong with either. Your priorities are your priorities, but you don't know what the priorities of either guy is right now. If you're a star in the NHL, which Raymond and Sider are and will be, you want to maximize value on your contracts, which means you want to go short-term, high dollar. Exactly what Austin Matthews is doing. I'm shocked more players don't do that. I understand the risk of you know one injury and it's all over and you're not getting that next contract, but how many career-ending injuries actually occur for a player in their 20s? Very, 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 very few. So you're playing the odds a little bit there. And this is speaking from Raymond and Sider's side. From Iserman's side, I've got two questions to sum up the answer on this one. We talked last episode about how Lucas Raymond's on pace for about 70 points this year and the way he's turning it on, the way his game is evolved. Do you believe he's going to be an 80 to 90 point player? Yeah. Do you believe Mo Sider is in all likelihood a number one defenseman? Yes. Then you absolutely do not bridge them. You get the absolute longest contract they're willing to take because it's only up for here. And I forgot to ask the third question for the context. Do you think the Red Wings win a Stanley cup in those bridge contracts? No, then you, you have no reason to bridge them unless that is all they're willing to accept. And that's, that's the ultimate crux of it because we're seeing the, the shift in power in negotiations go more and more to players from between the team and the players It's going more to players. And you know, who's driving it is young stars. It's not the veterans. It's not the UFAs. They've always had the leverage they've had. You have all the power once you're a UFA and you're a good player. But the young stars are winning leverage and winning contract battles when contractually speaking, they have almost nothing to work with. They're restricted free agents, but you're seeing it move in that direction. And that's why I'm a lot more wary now than I was in previous years of if they're sitting on bridge, then they're sitting on bridge. They might say, oh, I'll sign four instead of three, but I'm not doing seven or eight. You don't know until, you know, the the negotiation plays out and you start to hear something, but that that might be the situation. Exactly. So if I, if you look at what a typical bridge contract looks like for an NHL player, we'll use Jason Robertson, for example, who is probably the best example of a superstar player that took a bridge contract, got seven, seven, five for four. Maybe, maybe the Red Wings are in their contention window for the last year of that. Maybe two if you want to really go pie in the sky. But you get Sider and Raymond on very reasonable deals in that window. But then what's the next contract look like? Moe's almost certainly starts with a one. And Raymond... A million bucks. Wow. Thanks, Mo. How generous of you. Lucas's probably starts with a nine. And as we've learned over the years, and the biggest lesson, I think... I don't even think this is a hockey thing. I think this is a professional sports thing. You win championships by having your championship window be as long as possible, especially in hockey. That's such a fluky sport. Injuries, bounces, goalie heaters. The best teams in the world don't win the Stanley Cup every year. So 
if you want to maximize their contracts you're, and you're trying to narrow it down to this one, maybe two years at the end of a bridge where you can really maximize contract value, that's not a good strategy because you're n- limiting your ability to maximize. Whereas if I gave you the option now, and let's go at the very high end. So I don't even care what the AAV is on the bridge, but let's say Lucas and Mo say, I'll give you a three or four year bridge, or I'll sign eight years today. And Mo Sider's asking nine, seven, five, and Raymond's asking nine. What is better for the championship window of this team? You overpay now for eight years, or you take the gamble and see what those numbers come in at three to four years from now. I'll say you set this hypothetical up very well because that was painful to listen to. Like that, that's a that's an overpay. Like you are overpaying. You for are what they are right now and what a typical yes, I agree. You are overpaying for the next little while because you're gonna get cheaper years later. Fundamentally Doesn't strike me as a Steve Eiserman deal. No, but for the sake of the hypothetical, fundamentally the longer term deal is better. Yeah. Th- my point is bridge versus an overpay now. Cause I think you the point you, you either overpay now or you overpay later because Jason Robertson has I can hear the Brinks trucks in Texas yeah. th- that are getting backed up to his house. But that's exactly my point is you need to maximize the value on these contracts when you think you're going to be winning Stanley Cups. And if this stretch has taught us anything, it's not anytime soon. So by the time you are, you're saving maybe only a mil or two against the cap versus what they will get. But as we've seen with the cap gymnastics contenders have to do, that's a lot of money in a can pending window and that's assuming they don't go nuclear in those three to four years which would be a very good problem to have don't get me wrong but then are you paying mo 12 are you paying lucas nine and a half it's you're it's hoping a big deal you're hoping your bridge candidates are players you probably haven't even drafted yet exactly. realistically yes. like if you think yeah. about the teams that set up bridge contracts who are in their true contention window red wings probably don't have those players in the prospect pipeline right now and also it's worth noting and the whole reason i said that hypothetical is if i'm raymond or cider i want a bridge i want to maximize every last dollar i can so the way you get them off the bridge is you're probably going to have to overpay yeah so that is probably really close trade off the to the actual hypothetical that might be going on behind the scenes right now i don't know i like i Everything we've said is fundamentally correct. Like the that's how the contracts work right now. And that last point you made, like you overpay, and and frankly, you overpay your stars because if you're going to overpay anyone, you overpay your stars. Not to the tune of getting walked on term and AAV. I'm looking at you, Toronto. Like that's when you take it too far. But if you overpay your stars, you'd rather do that than overpay, you know, your middle to bottom of the lineup players. But I, the optimist in me, the fool who said. You know, Detroit is absolutely a playoff team a few weeks ago, looks at this and says, I wonder if there isn't an emotional moment to capture here where you can get them both to buy into the team long term and attach themselves to each other. Because, yes, it brings Lucas up, but it could also put a ceiling on on Cider. So I agree with what you said, Brad. It's a lot more rational and and pragmatic in terms of what will realistically play out. But I wonder if there isn't something else here. We'll see. We're going to be talking about that plenty until these contracts get renewed. Okay, very quickly here, uh, some updates in the Red Wings world. First off, the Red Wings signed a 2019 seventh round draft pick, Carter Guylander, a goaltender that was originally out of the AJHL and then played with Colgate in the NCAA. They signed him to a two-year ELC, adding him to the, the organization's not just depth, but future options in all reality. And he has an immediate tryout with the Grand Rapids Griffins. Like, this is a guy who overcame... Being a seventh round draft pick, a long shot, a project goalie. We talked about him when he was drafted. Like that's a project goalie. Got himself a contract and he did well. Like Colgate, he started a lot of games and I think he took a lot of tough games like pucks this year. But overall in the NCAA, he did he, he did enough and really well to get a contract with the Detroit Red Wings. Well, he's got the number one thing going for him that NHL teams are looking for in goalies now. Uh, big. Yep. He real big. He's he, listed at 6'4", 170. So, okay, he's not bigger than Kosa, but he's big. Yeah. He's not quite as athletic, but it, it's a strength of his. And he put up decent numbers. I think he won a tournament MVP or something with Colgate last year. 
which is a hell of a thing to do in the NCAA at any point. And, you know, he's a project and he's not a sure thing, but it's something. And for a seventh round pick, that's golden. And we all know how weird goalies are. You never know who and when one is going to pop off. And hey, maybe it's him. Who knows? Elsewhere, Detroit's organization, Trey Augustine, was named to the second team All-Big uh, Ten, so he got those honors, and he was also named to the All-Freshman team for Big Ten for the season he had with MSU. So Detroit's goalie pipeline is looking, has a lot of promise right now. Healthy. It's yeah. healthy. Yeah, it, it's it's come a long way. All right, some quick NHL news before we jump into overtime. Uh, the GM meetings have happened where they've recently proposed some rule changes. Some things have gone into effect immediately. In general, one of the immediate changes is players are no longer allowed to sit with their feet over the boards waiting for a line change. Like if you're sitting on the boards with your feet over it on the ice side, you'll get penalized. You need to have your feet on the correct side of the boards. I think a referee got cut recently, and that's put into effect immediately. It's a safety thing they deemed. Makes sense. And... Another thing that they're proposing, it would still need to go through the competition committee and, and final voting, but something they've put forward is expanding coaches challenge. Go no. to hell. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I, it, this one made sense to me because I, I thought the trade off was severe. So two situations that were talked about primarily is high sticks. So whether it was like a friendly fire high stick instead of a, a player actually getting high sticked or puck over glass, like whether it deflected off another player or another player's stick or something, you can review those. A coach can can choose to challenge that, but if they get it wrong, instead of being a five on four, they go to a five on three, and I think I think that's a big trade off. The brands are really gonna love when the NHL sends the TV viewers right into the Bauer logo, seeing if it goes off the stick. That's right. It's it's a real revenue gainer. I think I can't wait till we get freeze frames and videos of if this little black disc in a sea of bodies behind it touched this piece of clear material right before it goes in to said crowd. I can't wait, Ryan. What could possibly go wrong here? We're going to see more Brad vein bulges out of your forehead. So I think that's going to be great. The only thing that's come out of this, that's a positive and, you know, reading reactions online today and just reading the internet in general in regards to video reviews over the course of the year is I'm in the heavy majority now. It's so nice. People are so sick of reviews. I don't seem like the crazy old man yelling at a cloud anymore. Matt Duchesne's popularity has never been lower. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Elsewhere in the NHL, we didn't talk about this happened like a week ago, but a shipment of Yarmir Yager bobbleheads got stolen. Even Catherine knew about this, which means it's making its rounds on the real part of the internet. (laughs) That is, that was like the weirdest, I, I was like, is this a bit? But no, they actually. What do you do with those? Evan, how are you going to sell these without people realizing? You can't. <laughs> like, I was like, well, I no longer need to wallpaper my basement. You can't see the walls anymore. They have infinite value and no value all at the same time. Man. What would you pay for a truckload of Yammer Yawker bobbleheads? $69 maximum. Oh, anyhow. 68 was right there. I I almost went with that, but I was trying to make Evan laugh. He's not even here right now. He's already glazed over. I refuse to to laugh. He's trying to figure out what to do with all his bobbleheads that he can't sell. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Elsewhere, speaking of funny things, the Arizona Arena Saga, there is now a, a parcel of land that is open for bidding for 10 weeks. It'll be, the bidding will be finalized in June. If they get that, that is where they will allegedly put the arena if they win the bid, that's not the final hurdle. There's like floodplain remediation. There's actual, you know, boots on the ground. There's floodplains in Arizona. There is, well, there's a risk. There's a big risk of flooding in certain regions where it doesn't happen often, but when it happens, it's like cataclysmic and you need to do. Just build the arena on a giant boat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, then you can gamble on it. It's international waters. Absolutely. We could have pirates there too. Yeah, you have to change your team name, but you can lean into that as long as you keep the Kachina jersey somehow. Anyways, if there's a resolution to this where they have an arena, it doesn't look like it'll be next year or the year after or the year after even. And, <laughs> but if if they're waiting until June, I think Gary Bettman was the one who admitted 
well, we can't have them play in Utah. That would be too late to have them play elsewhere. So it looks like it's going to be in Arizona again next year. So here's what's going to happen. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't know how this ownership group has been able to buy so much time after hilarious attempt, after hilarious attempt, after hilarious attempt. I'm pretty sure from everything I've been reading and listening to that they actually have a pretty good chance of winning this auction, winning this auction. And, you know, they need to get city approval and all that, but it's not like they're trying to put a landfill there. Like an arena is probably not something that's going to get shot down by the local. They actually tried to put the arena on top of the landfill before and that didn't work. So they got to get there first. (laughs) Exactly. But somehow in hilarious fashion, they won't win an auction that was basically set up for them. But because it's too late, They got to play in mullet next year. So they're going to start exploring options C, D, E, and F, and they'll drag it out. And there'll be some other auction next season while they're playing at mullet and so on and so forth. And I refuse to believe anything else is going to happen until it actually happens. You you can't tell me the big revenue generators of this league are all that thrilled When the end of the season comes and they cut those checks for revenue sharing and they're seeing how much the Arizona Coyotes are getting off their backs. I think for that reason, and you're seeing some very intentional expansion noise like Atlanta, Utah, those places don't announce without NHL approval that they want an expansion cycle. Even though the NHL's response is we're not, we don't have an open uh, expansion cycle right now. It's, it's all. It's like a proxy war right now. Yeah. You're, I think you're completely right. Here's, here are the two outcomes in my mind because I'm foolish enough to predict something about this. One, they win the auction and they stay at mullet for the duration of building the arena, barring something crazy happening, which has just been this entire story. They eventually get the arena and teams have to hold their noses until that's built. But ultimately, the NHL is going to get what they want, which is a, a permanent team in Arizona. Two, they lose the auction or – something goes wrong and it's very obvious that it's not going to get done by like 2027 or something. And they have one more season at mullet. And during that season is when they do the, the transfer process to Utah. That's, I don't want to say writings on the wall. I thought the writing was on the wall before, but I think that's like, this is it. Like This is it. If anyone believes the Arizona coyotes, when they release a timeline for all of this, you are an idiot because If you don't think that there are going to be delays after delays with the construction of this arena and the opening of this arena and all the bureaucratic red tape involved in opening an arena, you're a fool because this ownership group has shown that timelines mean nothing and they can't seem to get anything done and execute it properly. All right. And final point here. I just want to acknowledge the, uh, the tragic passing of two former NHL players the news came out yesterday. Uh, Chris Simon was 52 years old and uh, Konstantin Koltsov was 42. Um, it was reported that both of them died of uh, suicide. Extremely tragic. Uh, Chris Simon's family came out saying that they believe it was because of CTE. Uh, obviously, you know, there's not been any kind of uh, official diagnosis or anything after that because that has to happen uh, after the person passes. But tragic situation and it has already and undoubtedly will even more reignite the whole linkage between repeated hits to the head and uh, the role the nhl may have in that and you know enforcers and things like that so we're we're entering in in what's going to be an infuriating news cycle where the nhl's legal stance means they say stupid things like there's no direct link between you know repeated hits to the head and cte which is obviously wrong and just like having to acknowledge the impact that the game has on that. And it's not even just like from fighting, but also just from taking hits repeatedly and all of that, the, the NHL and the hockey community lost uh, uh, Chris Simon and Konstantin Koltsov. So uh, first and foremost, our, our thoughts and our sympathies go out to their families. Yeah. And I'm glad you made the point about the legal speak with the NHL. Nobody should be surprised how they're going to handle this in terms of, not admitting there's a connection and not admitting there's a link. So everybody needs to understand it's going to happen. They're not going to come out and admit it because of all the legal implications around that. But I do want to make a point and sorry, Ryan and sorry, children for listening. Cause I am going to swear once here to emphasize a point here. The day after this happens and Bill Daly gets asked about it, 
And he says, just straight up, the science is lacking. You asshole. Read the room. No, con- just say no comment. We're not talking about that. I understand the situation. It's deeply tragic, but we're not going to comment on, you know, CTE right now. Avoid the question however the hell you can. We're not going to respect that either, but we'll understand it. To just come out and say that in a moment like this, just, my God. God, like so deeply infuriating. You can you can be willing to understand why the NHL has to say infuriating things, but just like there's, it doesn't need to be like that. No comment is an acceptable answer in scenarios like this. Yeah, we everybody will understand. You can't say anything because you would get sued to high hell and lose millions of dollars. You should lose those millions of dollars, but whatever. I get it. But to just. Have the Simon family who's going through one of the worst periods of their life saying, yeah, this was a, this is probably what contributed to it. And then just go, nah, as science is lacking on that, you're wrong. Like piss off. All right. We are going to jump into overtime here on this episode of the wing wheel podcast to wrap things up. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to support the show. Again, you get access to the bonus overtime, Patreon-exclusive episodes, the Patreon-exclusive Discord as well. You're entered into all of our giveaways. For example, the two tickets we give away to every Red Wings home game. You allow us to do things like uh, produce more great content, like Expected by Whom. Stay tuned. Maybe returning soon. As well, support the Jamie Daniels Foundation and continue to make this show bigger and better. So again, patreon.com slash podcast. Some questions from our patrons. Uh, Dennis Group says, despite positional value being what it is, has Raymond earned a payday that would equal Cider or come close? We chatted about it earlier, but he's moved himself a lot closer. Yeah, I don't think it'll be the same or Eclipse Mo, but it'll be closer than we thought it was going to be. Eric Asmus says, I'm starting to be of the mind that we need this to become an epic disappointment, blowing the playoffs so the changes are more drastic in the offseason. Bring back Cider and Raymond to big deals, hopefully get Kane back too, but then get some of these anchor vets out of town and replace them with some ELC players who are actually hungry and will try hard and fix the goaltending with Gibson or Markstrom, as you mentioned last episode. I'm of the mind that big changes need to happen. You heard our conversation with Max before. I don't think the outcome of this will speak to that because I think this losing streak was bad enough as is. I do Don't care what happens the rest of this year. The offseason plan should be the same. They could make the playoffs, maybe even steal a round or two. You know, ride a James Reimer and Alex Lyon hot streak, whatever. The plan this summer should still be unload a lot of the UFAs, try and unload some bad contracts, bring in a youth movement, even if that means taking a step back next year, which I don't think it necessarily does. But even if it does, that has to be the path forward. Because as we've seen with this group, Improved? Yeah. Anywhere near where they need to be? No, not even close. Red Feather Desert Dog says, make the playoffs or not, this past month verified what we suspected in December. The Red Wings are nowhere close to a playoff team without Larkin. How differently do you think Eisenman will treat this offseason now as opposed to how he might have had Larkin not gotten injured? Furthering that point that Brad just made, I think, like, not that this losing streak was a blessing at all. God, no. But... If you're going to draw any silver lining, if there is doubt that there need to be changes this offseason, those have to be gone now because, yeah, the, this team is hurting in a bad way without Larkin. And I, I would imagine Eisenman sees that a little bit more. Garbage Patch Kids Observer says, is Raymond considered elite yet? You gotta, I think you got to be at least bare minimum over a point per game to be elite. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say elite yet, but it's certainly within range. Considering he's not even 22 yet. I, yeah, I think it's, we'll call it likely. Yeah, you can do quite a bit in the star range, but even to say like this guy could be elite, that's huge. All right, next one here is from Joseph Barry. He says, hey boys, if a guy like Marty Nachash is possibly available this summer, is it worth the cost of acquiring a guy like him? If yes, what does a package even look like for him? Thanks and keep up the good work. Uh, yes, absolutely. He's available? Did I miss something? Could be. Carolina seems to be a a team that's making a lot more broad, bold moves, like kind of Vegas-esque. And I wouldn't be surprised if they, like he was potentially going to be part of what was going to go for Pedersen, right? Like we don't, we haven't talked about that very much, but they almost got Elias Pedersen and there was going to be a lot going the other way. So if he's expendable for a big move in that deal, who's to say he's not expendable otherwise? 
then yeah, they should go after them. It'll cost a lot. Like you're talking, we'll call it three premium assets. However you want to break that down and premium means truly premium. We're not talking about Carter Mazer here. Next one here. Uh, I'm going to modify the name just because <laughs> it's, I'll read it on the Patreon exclusive over time. We'll call it Dylan Larkin's hockey butt. Uh, it says, what's your take on Beargren? He plays two games only to get scratched the next two. I can't imagine this being a good look for him in the organization's future. Was it a showcase possibly for the offseason? Thanks, fellas, and keep up the amazing work. I love the pod. I think it was necessity. They just needed to bring someone up, and he was the best of the bunch. Beargren, I love the guy, and I don't like the way they've handled him. But the cold reality of the situation is Beargren is a very replaceable, very niche middle six forward like he, he's not a guy that is going to make or break anything within your organization are the red wings a worse team with him playing third line wing yeah probably not are they a lot better yeah probably not eisman said in his press conference like if bear comes up and help this this team win then i'm not going to send him down just to you know preserve his waiver exempt status because if he plays one more game he is no longer waiver exempt they're at the limit with him and I was like, okay, fair. And they started sitting him and I was like, but also fair because he didn't exactly, it's kind of an unfair task for him because he didn't exactly kick down the door. But what what are you really expecting from him? He's a good player. I like him. I still think they could have Bergeron on this team and have it work. Cold reality is right though, Brad. He's He's not on one extreme end of the spectrum in my mind. So maybe an opportunity comes up in the future where he can kick down the door, but it just hasn't happened yet. And last comment here. This one from Kevin Wolf says, Ken Daniels is the best play-by-play announcer in the business. That's it. That's the comment. Ken, Mick, the entire Valley Sports Detroit crew, Ken Cowell in the radio call, like, we're spoiled. And, uh, you know, if we think we have a a tough task talking about this team during, like, the really low points, they have to do it live. On the fly. On the fly, in-game, watching it unfold. Like, that is, you talk about a thankless task. That is as thankless as it gets. professionalism. (laughs) Red Wings fans are, I don't know what we would do without them. I really don't know this entire rebuild and like, even just like that streak, like battle tested, battle tested. The highlight of the rebuild was watching uh, Mickey just get beleaguered with some of the things they were doing. (laughs) Mickey's like, Mickey's a phenomenal color commentator, but some of his most valuable stuff is just reading like the small like mumbles he says in the background, like, oh my God, like, what are you doing? Or when something good's going to happen, he goes, look at this, look at this. Like you can, you can read the entire situation and not even have eyes on the game just by how Mickey's reacting to it. <laughs> Anyhow, shout out to them. And again, happy belated birthday to Ken Daniels. All right. We're going to wrap up this episode of the winged wheel podcast. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you to Labatt blue light for sponsoring this episode and to all of our Patreon supporters. We could not do it without you. Uh, our name level supporters on Patreon, Arjun Shanker, Yves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Icon, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland, Glenn Brabham, Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conant, Sea Lion, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Ad Patch, Curse of Perpetual Shame, Admiral Matt S. of the Cheesebag Navy, Al the Octopus, Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Carl Provi, Citizen High Five, Clip Clop Nene, Connor Scovey, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Fear the Goalie, God Creatives, Give Blood Fight, Probert, Have You Ever Drank Baileys from a Shoe, Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassam Al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Jonathan Miller, Kalen Wood, Marcus, Marlon Winchester, Matt Keeler, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, RA, Red Feather Desert Dogs, Ryan 50 Handicap Hannah, Scott Martin, Skeletor, new name level supporter, welcome. Screen Lube, that's what I appreciate about you. Wallman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, AB, Adam Rose, Axels, Sandy Pelica, Bellingham Acid Balls, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Chuck Buffchest, the Tarplet Scoon, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheeseback Space Force, Connor Layton, Corey Prita, Darren Fick, D Boss Snip Show, Derek James, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, insert clever hockey pun here, James Pridemore, Johnny Page, new name level supporter, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, Jogan Rafferty Fan Club, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Les Grossman's Ungodly Firestorm, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Michigan Boy in Avs Country, Ophelia, Red Wing Tar Heel, new name level supporter, Reed, Shahid Syed, Stephen, The Hodag, The Mexinadian, The Hat123, Tom Iserplan Respector, 
Wings fan in St. Louis, ex formerly AA Ron, and your second favorite patron. Talk to you folks on Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.